Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day affirms the power of affirmations. A study published in Social Cognitive and Effective Neuroscience was able to capture the effect of affirmations using an MRI machine. So patients who gave positive self-affirmations had increased activity in different parts of the prefrontal cortex and in other parts of their brains. And participants with greater stimulation in those sections of the brain, which control processing and valuation, had less sedentary behavior afterwards than participants who didn't have self-affirmations. In other words, when your self-talk was good, you moved more. And when your self-talk was bad, you sat on your ass all the time, which is kind of interesting, but they could see it in the brain. And that research indicates that future behavior and even your thoughts can be improved just by affirmations. And all of this goes back to prove that the little engine that could, could because of neuroscience, right? If you like that cool fact of the day, you are going to love my new book, Game Changers. One of the people that I learned from and that I mention in Game Changers uh, is a profoundly interesting and cool and well-known human being who has done a lot more than just uh, write a little book about chicken soup. That would be chicken soup for the soul. We've got none other than Jack Canfield back on Bulletproof Radio. Jack, thank you for being here. My pleasure, Dave. I'd always do anything you ask. Uh, I, I genuinely appreciate our our friendship and the chance to have have you know, had dinner with you a couple times at, at your events, and just getting to understand that uh, when I I first read Chicken Soup for the Soul uh, back when I was in uh, eighth grade. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I do get people that tell me that it's embarrassing. <laughs> They're thirty five years old, then they go, "Oh, I read Chicken Soup for the Soul when I was in the eighth grade. <laughs> How to make a guy feel older." <laughs> Uh, I might have been out of eighth grade, but you know, you, you always sort of, of get a, a picture of a human being uh, from reading their their work and all that, uh, and then to meet you in person and sort of see that there's a lot more going on than just that, and, and to realize that you spent the last, I'd say almost a half of, of your career, if I'm judging my timelines right, uh, focusing on these principles of of high success and, and high performance and looking at what some incredibly uh, impactful people have done, uh, including you, uh, to the point that you're now teaching that stuff, uh, the breakthrough to success training, that's just a part of what you're doing to, uh, to give back to the world. And I wanted to pick your brain on some of the stuff that you're doing, some of the stuff that I wrote about in Game Changers, but just kind of dig deeper on what are people who are changing the world uh, what are they doing, and and what have you seen in your decades of working with people like that? Well, I've worked with everything from you know presidents of countries to CEOs of corporations to people in prisons and, and people on welfare. So the broad spectrum of people all across the the wide diversity of our planet, and have taught in fifty seven countries around the world, and we see everything happening. I see people that are winning athletic events. I see people that are out there. Uh, creating schools in Africa, people that are uh, building new, you know, high tech uh, interventions and and making a real difference. Just very recently, I spoke at a conference where the guy was a CEO of of a major travel company, and he literally decided he wanted to take a year and put some of the the smartest people in the world on a boat travel around the world with these entrepreneurs and inventors and solve problems. So just to give you one example, they, they pulled into a port in Africa and they started realizing that a lot of kids uh, couldn't hear. And so they the problem with, uh, you know, the normal hearing aids was that these people had no way to replace the batteries because uh, they were poor. So these guys invented hearing aids you could wear. They had little solar panels on them that recharged themselves as you walked around outside and basically then taught the people in that country to manufacture those uh, ear, you know, earpieces so that basically they created a new industry. They made it so it was sustainable. And, and you know, you see people like doing that just everywhere. And it's exciting to know that that we all have the capacity not only to feel fulfilled, but to make a huge difference. You know, one of my favorite stories is about a guy who was a co-owner of the Seattle Seahawks, and he was miserable. 
And so he's, he gave this talk I heard once called His Life Went Through Four Stages. The first stage was called Stuff. It was worth $600 million. So he bought all the stuff he thought that would make him happy. You know, the planes, the boats, the viewing room in his house, the exotic car collection, his wife's jewelry, etc. And he wasn't happy. So he said the second stage was called Better Stuff. And he bought a bigger plane, a bigger house, <laughs> you know, a bigger boat, all that. He said, I still wasn't happy. And then I, he said I, he went through a stage called Different Stuff. That's when he bought the Seattle Seahawks with a bunch of people, thinking that that would make him uh, happy. It'd be the owner's booth and go down on the field and all that. And still wasn't happy. Then a friend of his called him up and said, I'm going to Bosnia Herzegovina to give away wheelchairs. Would you like to join me? And he said, sure. So he got on this guy's private plane. They flew to Bosnia. They landed. They gave out 40 wheelchairs that day to kids who either lost their legs in landmines or uh, in, you know, congenitally born that way. And so what happened, he said this one kid, about 11-year-old boy, he put him in a wheelchair and he started to walk away and the boy wouldn't let him walk away and he was holding onto his leg. And so he turned around and, and Ken said, through tears and an interpreter, this young boy said, please don't leave yet. I want to memorize your face. So when we meet again in heaven, I can thank you one more time. Aww. And, you know, he said, that was the first time in my life I felt pure joy. And I realized that this, the last stage of his life was called purpose. He said, I'd found my purpose, which was to make a difference, to give something away rather than just accumulate more stuff. So he came home and started the Ken Baring Wheelchair Foundation. He's given away something like 40,000 wheelchairs all around the world. And then he's also started digging wells in Africa because he realized wheelchairs don't help you if there's no water to drink. That's not, you know, <laughs> bad for you and going to kill you. So I think that, you know, we each go through our own stages of evolution where we go through survival and belonging and but we get to self-actualization where we want to make a difference. And I think for me, and I know for you, the truest joy we ever have is when we contribute to someone else's life. I and mean, you get the feedback all the time that people are feeling healthier and happier and I do my work and people succeed more. And so, and now you've got this book that's helping people succeed and the game changer book. So basically I think that's the true essence of everything that, that we want to do. And then everyone finds their arena to do that in. And um, I've interviewed God, hundreds of people and ultimately they find that that's the most fulfilling aspect of their life. One of the 46 laws that emerged uh, in this book uh, was around uh, uh, money doesn't make you happy. After talking to these hundreds of people, and I said, what are the three most important things uh, that, that you found? None of them said money or power. Mm -hmm. uh, none of the, none of them, I mean, they, they all care to the point that you got to get your needs met, but it's not the focus. It's, it's not why they do what they do. And what I found is that the largest buckets after analyzing with statistics, what people said is they want to be smarter, they want to be uh, faster, but they want to be happier. Mm -hmm. Happier people perform better. And what makes you happy is is doing what you're here to do. And and your friend there is, is such a prime example of that. We realized, oh, like I, I this is what, what gives me energy. This is what makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that everything that anyone does is because they make it it'll make them feel better. Even being smarter, even being, you know, yeah. faster is all the things you want is because you think it's going to give you some experience of joy. And and reality is that, you know, things can give you a certain experience of joy for a short period of time. We've all bought that thing we thought was going to make us happy. Uh -huh. The pool table, the new computer, you know, and after a few days, well, I bought a pool table thinking I've got recreation handled. And now it's where we fold the laundry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, my first uh, universal machine at home was definitely a good clothes rack. I, I know yeah. what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> One of the laws in, in the book is around money doesn't buy happiness. Right. So stop thinking it will. Uh, and I talk about some of the research there. Uh, one group of research says about $74,000 of income and on average in the US, probably higher in California, New York. Above that, another dollar of income doesn't equal more happiness right below that the safety it provides actually does um so um, there are people who can be happy with with nothing and i i've seen that in cambodia and in very very poor parts of the world there are people who are genuinely happy who have vanishingly little uh, but uh probably if they had a little more money that it would probably would increase happiness um, so i i was in that trap uh, as a young man i had i had made six million dollars when i was 26 uh and i i was if I would have just stepped back, I was set for life, right? And uh, what did I do? I told a friend, I'll be happy when I have 10 million, 
right? And, which is just the most egotistical, just just wrong-headed statement I could ever think of, but I did make it. Uh, and I wasn't alone in that kind of thinking uh, at this company where everyone suddenly had become wealthy. Uh, and I lost that money uh, two years later, um, in part because uh, instead of walking away with what I had, I, I had to stay in. And uh, and that sort of thing is one of those 46 pieces of knowledge that if, if I could go back and tell myself when I was 20, hey, you need to know these things. And instead of just believing what you know, what I say, like, why don't we listen to what Jack Canfield says? Why don't we listen to what hundreds of other people who've done something noteworthy do? Because instead of emulating one of us, maybe you could just look at what mattered to most of us. And, uh, and from there, uh, start just prioritizing what you're going to do first. Uh, and hopefully whatever makes you happiest fastest is going to reduce drag in the rest of, in, in the rest of your life. In your own evolution, Jack, um, when did you stumble across that knowledge around stuff doesn't make you happy? I think I, I learned it really quickly, probably with the aid of some psychotropic drugs. <laughs> <laughs> I was probably in my around 29 or 30 and, um, uh, someone introduced me to LSD and I, I took it and I really got very clear that the things in, outside me were not going to make me happy, but the relationships I had with people, my ability to meditate and get in touch with my own inner peace and joy were the things that really mattered. Um, obviously, I always wanted enough money to pursue my travel, my education, to have good yeah. education and medical care for my children and so forth. I mean, I still have a kid who's 28 in college, a graduate school. And um, so not having that money would have been, you know, uncomfortable not to be able to provide him with the opportunities I want him to have. But um, like you said, you know, I, I made six million dollars one year as well. And I bought all the stuff you're supposed to buy. You know, I bought four cashmere sweaters in different colors and all that kind of stuff. And and then you realize you have everything you need and, and beyond what you need. I mean, people live with one sweater all over the world. But I, I just really got that for me, it was about relationships. And and you know, I remember I remember being with my wife and thinking, you know, if we were poor and we were living in a hut raising pigs in Mexico, I would, it would still be your body, your sense of humor, your eyes, your love, your compassion, your joy. It wouldn't matter if we were living in a hut or we're living in a castle, but that's what really matters. And as you said, we've seen people all over the world in Africa, when I've been there several times, who are extremely happy. You know, I think the biggest problem for a lot of people is when TV came along and you started watching shows and you saw that other people had things you didn't have. Like you see these kids in the ghetto that don't have Air Jordans and they think Air Jordans make you cool. And before, when I grew up in the 50s, if you didn't have stuff, you didn't know anyone else had it because you lived in your neighborhood, which was pretty much the same socioeconomic level. Uh, now, we every millionaire and billionaire is being interviewed and we see the homes of the rich and famous and cribs and shows like that. And a lot of people grow up thinking right. they have to have that to be cool. And there's another statistic that shows that no matter what people have, if you ask them how much is enough, it's always more than they have. People making 100,000 will say 300,000. People with 300,000 will say a million. People with a million will say 2 million. I have many friends who want to be a billionaire. When I ask people in my seminars to set a goal for financial, because I have seven areas I haven't set goals in, no one ever says $673,000. They always go millionaire. You know, it's just a round number that people pick out of the air. And then they beat themselves up because they haven't achieved that yet. And it's kind of crazy. Um, so, but for me, as I said, I was probably in my late 20s, early 30s when I, I got it. Uh, you said something I didn't expect you to say. Uh, you, you said that sometime in your, your mid-20s, uh, you had an, an awareness come to you on LSD. Yes. Uh, much like Steve Jobs and right. you know, the founders of Google and, and Elon Musk and it turns out one of the laws in Game Changers is get out of your own head. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be with uh, LSD or uh, mushrooms or ayahuasca, which is something that I, I used mm -hmm. uh, with a shaman in Peru. Mm -hmm. um, but I had a dinner in New York uh, that I write about in the book with about 25 very influential people who'd been invited to this dinner. And it was set up as a Jeffersonian dialogue where only one person would say something at the table at a time and sort of set the topic and then we'd all talk about it for a while. Uh, but not all talk in little groups, but just talk so everyone could hear what one person said. Mm -hmm. And when I had a chance, it just came to me and said, how many people in the room, if you're willing to acknowledge this, uh, have used 
a hallucinogenic substance for personal development. And every single hand in the room went up. People from 25 to 70, hedge fund managers, CEOs, you know, actors, uh, people doing charitable work. And I was surprised there was no one in the room who hadn't tried it. And it, it seems like that's a change from what we would have seen 20 years ago. I mean, certainly 25 years ago, I, I wouldn't have been able to say I've done ayahuasca or anything like that. I didn't do any of that till I was in my uh, mid to late 20s. And certainly you can do Vipassana, you can meditate, you can do holotropic breathing. This isn't a, an appeal for people to go out and, and do legal or illegal stuff. But how often do you see the high performers um, that you work with have some practice, whether it's pharmaceutical or not, to just get far outside themselves so sure. they can look back on themselves? Well, first of all, I will just tell you, I, I won't name names because I'm not sure they would want to be public. Yeah. But I, Please don't. I was flying in a plane over Dubai a uh, little, you know, twin engine plane. We, we were guests of a person there, and they were bringing together five of the top success gurus and coaches of the world. And we were up in a plane, and we started talking. But every one of us had done psychedelics at some point in our in our careers. And and I thought, you know, this is everywhere I go, and I meet people. Most people that are super successful either have a meditation practice, or they have engaged in what I would call safe psychotropic experiments, you know, plant medicine, and not like recreational, let's get high and go to Disneyland, but let's, let's get together with a shaman or let's get together with someone that's conscious or let's just, you know, go in our home and make it clean and wonderful and get some fruit and then, you know, fast for a day and then do a psychotropic. And there was a time where I was working with a shaman. He came up to my house in Santa Barbara twice a year for, I think, five years, uh, January and July, and we would do mushrooms and ayahuasca and all kinds of things, you know, and every time I would have some major breakthrough. Something Ramdas said, which I think is true, is that the psychedelic drug can give you a glimpse of the mountaintop, but it won't keep you there. Yes. And so now that you know what's possible in terms of awareness and insight and peace and joy, that's when the, the spiritual practices come into practice, you know, whether it's qigong or tai chi or meditation or um you know other kinds of sacred practices and that's so i've been meditating since i, I was about 26 i think when i learned to meditate and i'd be lying if i said it every day but i do it you know most days and it's been it's been critical when people often ask me you know i have a book called the success Principles: 67 principles of success and in that book uh people will often ask me you know well what's the most important principle if you could only pick one, and I always answer, if you could only pick one organ in your body, which one would you keep? <laughs> the point is, it, it wouldn't work, you know? So, but I, the three, I always say, you got to meditate, you have to have a mastermind group, and you have to take action. And these are three things, I think, that if I had to boil it down to three, you know, and then there's other things, be clear about your goal, be in touch with your life purpose, et cetera, we can go into that. But the point being that meditation is where Chicken Soup for the Soul, the title for that came from in a meditation, that that brand is now worth probably $100 million. It's generated over a billion dollars of book sales around the world. And that came in a meditation, you know, so um, I can't overrate the, the the value of it in, in addition to the inner peace i have the i think the anti-aging that comes from it um all of that it's amazing what can come to you during uh, those deep states mm -hmm. and if you've never experienced it it's really hard to put words to it, it it's it's ineffable uh, one of my favorite words yeah. which means you know it, it's a, it cannot be described by words which is cool that you have a word to do that i came out of one of those weird states and wrote the entire uh, outlined for my very first book around uh, fertility, around having uh, children who are healthier and smarter than they would be if you did nothing. Mm -hmm. And that whole thing, I just came from somewhere, uh, but I, you know, the, the whole world was buzzing when I wrote it down and that was without substances. That was just from, you know, tapping into something that was already in right. there. Do you have advice for, for people listening who've never, never tapped into that? The, the, the rational people, you know, the, the engineers, the, the skeptics, people who say, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm a human robot. Uh, I'm going to upload my consciousness to the internet someday. And, you know, uh, uh, kind, kind of that, that's not logical. How, how do they tap into to seeing that there's something? Well, it's not logical. That's the whole point. You know, the, the, <laughs> the, the, the reality is you have two sides of your brain. You know, one is the unlogical side that's more intuitive, more holistic, more gestalt, and the other is the rational side. And so 
it's like, you know, you have the male and female aspects of you. So why would you cut off one part of yourself? You know, then you become a halfwit, as one of my friends likes to say, you know. <laughs> so it's the combination of intuition and spiritual awareness and, you know, inner knowing and inner sensing, uh, tapping into higher consciousness, et cetera. But then using your rational brain as the servant of that so that you can do all the things that, you know, the engineers and those people do to create wonderful products to manifest your dreams and goals because you can set goals and use your rational mind to figure out the steps to get there, uh, to do the research that you do so well, that people like Dawson Church does so well. And and I like yeah. to do neuroscience. I love that new statistic you shared at the beginning of the show. Um, so <laughs> it's 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 both. It's, it's, it's not an either or, it's a both and. And so I often, feel bad for people who are missing that part you know maybe it takes that to overdevelop one side and have these rational breakthroughs um but i don't think that's the way to play the game i think you want both parts of yourself there's a reason the corpus callosum exists connecting the two sides of the brain they're they're, they're supposed to interact with each other <laughs> One of my, the favorite quotes I, I've ever heard in all the Bulletproof stuff I've done was was very early on, I was coaching people on cognitive function. And I had a, an engineer in Silicon Valley, uh, somewhere in his mid 40s. And I asked him to do heart rate variability mm -hmm. training, which, which trains you to breathe in sure. a certain way. I, I know that you're you're connected with Debbie and the Heart right. Math Institute. I've been an advisor for a while. So I said, look, every day for a month, I want you to spend 20 minutes just doing this weird computer driven breathing exercise that's going to teach you uh, how to control the spacing of your heartbeats. And he says, all right, uh, this is quantitative. I can do that. And he calls me after about 20 days and he goes, Dave, I, I think I experienced bliss. <laughs> and I, th these are words you do not hear out of a computer program. Right, 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 I mean, it's right, very unusual, right. especially, you know, eight years ago or something. Uh, but it still sticks with me to this day because uh, it, it was one of those unaccessed states of performance that was there and in my own life i don't know how to do the rational stuff without having the irrational stuff coexist at the same mm -hmm. time and and i i worked in game changers uh, to to try and, and and explain to people not just through my own experience but through those of people who've been on on the show uh, look there is some way to tap into this and whether it's going to burning man whether it's fasting for a week in a cave um, you know, trying plant medicines, whatever it is, it doesn't really matter, but you've got to achieve that ability to get outside, uh, get outside yourself so that you can see that stuff that you, that you try to think doesn't exist. Um, but it's one of the most challenging and scary things, uh, that, that, that I've ever done. Uh, and it seems to be that way for most people the first time they do it. What has to happen in order to be successful in that journey is you have to give up control. At some point, like if you, if you take a pill that you know is going to alter your consciousness, you're not in control anymore. Something else takes over. Um, and when you meditate deeply, often other things kind of, you surrender into memories coming up, trauma being revisited, consciousnesses that you're not aware of becoming present, like angelic forces, whatever you want to call them. And I think for a lot of people, giving up that control is very scary especially if you had a childhood where you got wounded when you gave up control in some way. And so oh, then... Which, which happens to yeah. most of us you know, between bullying right. and parents. And then if, and if you don't stuff. heal those wounds and reconnect with the, the, let's call it the inner child or whatever you want to call it, and it's very difficult for adults to do that. And so they will develop careers around protecting themselves from feeling those feelings, feeling out of control, um, you know, whatever. What is the single most impactful, we'll call it healing technology that you've worked with or that you know about uh, to help people heal those old traumas that are leading to those behaviors? Well, I'm actually writing a book about it with a woman named Lise Jan with awesome. Lise Janelle, who I think you know. She's a member of the Transformation yeah. Leadership Council. And I think there are many, many healing modalities. I mean, there are some shamans who can muscle test you. And like someone just removed 52 relationships of my wife. My wife's an empath. She feels everything very, very strongly. And she went in to see this shaman and he basically said, you have 52 people hanging out inside you. They're not like, it's not like possessions, but they're just people that you've taken on too much of their energy. And so he worked with her for an hour and a half and she came home. She looked like 10 years younger. She was lighter. She was joyful. She was more compassionate, less judgmental. I was going, holy mackerel, see that guy again. You know, this is good. 
But from my own work, and I think it's something easily learnable and doable for most people without having to study shamanism for 20 years like this guy did, is uh, what, what Lise calls the heart freedom method. But the general idea is you look at any place in your life where you feel blocked. So you've got an unconscious limiting belief or you wouldn't be blocked there. And so, or, or an, an unhealed wound. And so then you basically close your eyes, you get in touch with your, you just scan your body, what do you feel in relationship to that? And then like, where is there a sensation of numbness or of pain or of tension? Because numbness is numbing out the pain or the tension. And then you imagine what feeling is in there. And then you basically go back to the earliest time you can remember feeling that same sensation and that same feeling. Everyone I've done this with, I've done it with literally 8,000 people at a time in a seminar in India. We're at 8,000 Herbalife people in a room, all speaking Tamil. We did this with a translator. <laughs> and um, everybody goes back to somewhere between three and eight years old where they had a traumatic event and they made a limiting decision. That will never happen again. I will never tell a joke. I will never be sexual. It's not okay to want money. It's not okay to be smarter than your father. It's not okay to outperform your sister. You know, whatever it is that's blocking them. And then it comes into consciousness. And then through a series of a couple of simple questions, you can basically let that go, reframe it, come up with a new decision. And I have them go into the future and have the wise being. It could be Jesus or Muhammad or their own higher self or their own 83-year-old wise enlightened being. It's them give advice to the current person, everybody gets value. Nobody gets stuck that I've ever worked with. And and they they literally, uh, they often look younger. They're, they, they report like two months later, they finish their book. They finally started asking for what they were worth in terms of their business, you know, on and on and on it goes. So that's really powerful. Tapping, I think, is really powerful to get rid of like negative feelings and limiting beliefs. EFT tapping, I use that a lot. Um, those are my two go-to things. It's really powerful that you just described that. It's uh, it's it's got a lot of overlap with the process that I use at Forty Years of Zen, the the neurofeedback mm -hmm. thing, and, and what I've done, where I've got electrodes showing my brain when I when I'm running it through a similar process. Like, when's the first time I felt that way? Am I really feeling that? How do I flip into another state to break the the mental connection mm -hmm. that you have that that you set up back then? Uh, and man, when when you sit down with someone who doesn't come from a tradition of meditation, you know, whose, whose parents, you know, are, are atheists or you know, devout, uh, religious and with one belief set and, and sort of say, you can do all this stuff. Um, it just, it sounds, it, frankly, it sounds like crazy. Pants. At least it did <laughs> until I was about 30. I'm like, like, what is going on with these wacky right. people? Right. Uh, but I, I love it that you're, you're sitting here and it, it's hard to deny the impact you've had and the success you've had. And, and you can straight face say, my wife saw a shaman and I saw a difference. And like, that's the core observational part of, of the scientific method. And, you know, it, it takes a lot of mental gymnastics to hear, to hear you say that, or I, I would say similar things. I, I've seen shamans that had profound effects on me on family members. And, um, I can't tell you exactly how it works. They could tell me, they could tell you how they believe it works, whether that's the real story or not. It doesn't really matter because you got the results you wanted. Um, and there's there's that resistance, the, the the cognitive resistance of this being possible. And I'm hoping by by you sharing it, by other people who've, who've done meaningful things, who are not crazy, mm -hmm. you know, who are highly functioning human beings, who say this matters, that maybe we get people who would never consider that this is even possible to at least have an inkling. Because damn it, if someone had done this for me when I was 20, you know that 10 years when I was 20 and 30 when I mm -hmm. suffered a lot, I didn't have to do that if I would have done this yeah. work earlier. How early can people start doing that kind of work? Oh, uh, really early. Uh, just to give you an example, I visited uh, Fairfield, Iowa, where the Transform Medi Transform was it? Transcendental Meditation Center is. And they have a school there. It starts in kindergarten, goes through high school. And I was fortunate enough to spend a day in the school. And um, I was watching these little preschoolers sitting in meditation for 20 minutes in the morning, all cross-legged, just looking, you know, blissed out. And when I knew it was really powerful. I I was in the hallway in the high school section or middle school, I don't know one of those, and these kids were passing, you know, like between classes. And this one boy went up and started teasing this girl. And she just looked at him and said, Marvin, I know you're trying to tease me. I know you're just wanting to have fun. I'm having a very difficult day today. I would appreciate it if you wouldn't do it. He went, oh, I'm sorry. 
Now that would now that would not happen in a normal middle school, right? But the kids have developed this both personal power, which she was demonstrating, and the personal empathy and sensitivity, which he was demonstrating. And it came from learning to meditate. They start teaching these kids when they're three, four, five years old to meditate. Um, and and you look at the the um, the the temples in Tibet and Nepal and India where they have the Buddhists and they give away their kids to the monastery and they start meditating when they're five and six years old. Um, so I don't think there's a, it's, it's ever too uh, early to start teaching that. Well, I, I think those are such powerful skills. And I know my, my kids, a uh, school doesn't teach meditation. They teach a lot of you know, emotional development and kindness and things like that. But uh, it, it may be harder for parents to teach kids to meditate uh, just because you're the parents did you teach your son to meditate? I did. I did. I did. I did. And and I also taught him how to do EFT tapping and all kinds of stuff. I remember as a Christmas present when he was about, mm, I'm going to say 14, 15 years old, I took him into uh, my office and I said, I want to give you another gift. I'd just given him a bunch of clothes and stuff. He's really into clothes. And um, I think I gave him a couple hundred bucks to buy what he wanted. And I took him into my office and I said, I want to teach you a really important tool. You can use it whenever you're stressed out and if you're about to take a test, whatever. And so I taught him how to tap when he was feeling anxiety. He The next day he said, Dad, you know the best present you gave me? I said, no. He says, you taught me how to get rid of stress. Because he was, he stressed himself out a lot, it seemed, you know. And um, so, you know, the, we, we can teach kids. I mean, I taught kids how to do heart talks where we sit around in the family and everyone, we pass around a, a like a talking stick like they do in the Hopi tradition. Mm -hmm. And we did that, at, you know, every week at some point, like usually toward the weekend. So the kids could talk about their feelings, which I think is important. And, and yes, we meditated as a group sometimes. And I took him to a workshop with uh, Hale Dwaskin learning the Sedona method when he was 16. And, um, wow. you know, he loved it. And so basically it's, it's just kids love things that make them feel better. It's just that simple. You know, sometimes they're a little weird out if you wait too long, then it's not what all their friends are doing. And, but if you start young, uh, and it's never too late to at least try, and, you know, one thing I did with my kids, I would find a book I thought they should read and I would pay them to read the book. I mean, you pay them to wash the car. What's more important, you know? So yeah. basically I'd say, here's how you can learn 20 bucks or whatever. And you've know, got to give me a book review report. And um, I got to ask you a few questions, make sure you really read it. And that was uh, an easier way to get an allowance than doing chores, which I don't think is that critical. Jack, man, th that is huge advice for parents. I, I, I give my kids, you know, a couple bucks a day if, if they, they get a, a dollar if they, you know, clear or set the table mm -hmm. and another dollar if they do it without whining. <laughs> and, I love it. And that, that second dollar was the best investment I've ever made in my mental Yeah, there you go. Uh, but the idea of, of paying them to read a book is really smart. Yeah, or listen to audio tapes. To, well, now it's CDs. I say tapes because I'm of that generation. But yeah, same thing. Oh, uh, okay. You just uh, you just upgraded my parenting. What a what a fantastic Good. idea! All right, I'm I'm borrowing that one. <laughs> uh, uh, something else uh, that did make it into the book. Uh, in fact, it's law number three in the book. Is something that I do with my kids, and the law number three in the book is when you say you'll try, you're lying, mm -hmm. and it's just two sentences kind of describe the law, and and the main law goes like this: uh, the words you choose matter more than you think not just to the people you speak to, but also to your own nervous system. Your language sets your limits and to a great extent shapes your destiny. When you unconsciously use words that make you weak, you stop trusting yourself and lead others to question your integrity. Game changers deliberately choose truthful words to build trust and break free from self-imposed limitations. So stop trying and start doing. Mm -hmm. and, and I actually tell your story from your last interview uh, as one of the examples in that law about how it works uh, because uh, you talk about how in your office you keep empty fish bowls and if someone on your team uses uh, one of these words that that are not truthful or that take away their power they put two dollars in the bowl uh, not to punish them for it but just to to make it visceral that there's a cost to using the words mm -hmm. what are the words that uh, that you teach your staff not to use well the first one is can't there's, you know, basically you either choose to or you choose not to. And um, so that's that's one of the big words. The word try. Uh, often I'll yeah. demonstrate in a seminar. I'll say I have people put something on their lap they can pick up. I say pick it up, put it down, 
pick it up, hold it as high as you can, put it down, pick it up, put it down. Now try to pick it up. And the whole room just freezes. Nobody knows what to do. <laughs> and as soon as you say try to pick it up, they think, it, what does he want? You know, and I'll see some people going like this where they're pushing their hand up slowly, you know, like they're efforting. <laughs> but the point is, as soon as I say to my son, since we talked about parenting, try to keep your room clean, there's an assumption in that that he might not be able to. So why would you try? You just do it. You know, so keep your room clean. Uh, be home by 12 o'clock. Don't try to be home by 12 o'clock. That, that gives him permission to not do it because the word try. Another phrase is have to. There's nothing you have to do. They're all choices. You don't, you don't have to pay your taxes. You might go to jail, but you don't have to. You choose to. So these are all what we call victim language. Um, should is another thing, you know, that people say, well, I should. Well, do you want to or not? You know, basically. Um, but those are the, the big ones. Can't, have to try should there's probably some others if i were to need oh yeah you don't need anything other than air and water and heat and and, and a little bit of food but a lot of times people say i need something and then when you don't get it you feel really bad because you feel like you and it's also a way to manipulate people i need you to do this for me if you really love me (laughs) you know if you really love me you do this as opposed to i want you to you know this is my request and uh, because need comes from a powerless place, they all are reinforcing your powerlessness. And so basically, we want to eliminate those. Have you succeeded in eliminating those from the way you communicate with your, your employees, with your family, with your friends? When I'm consciously intending to get a result, yes. I will sometimes say try when I'm not really thinking too hard about it. When you're not really trying. Yeah. <laughs> no, I go unconscious sometimes. And it's a habit that I had for years before I learned that that was a word that I shouldn't be using or I, I choose not to because it, uh, see, already we catch ourselves not twice in one sentence. But exactly. But it, it is, it's a habit. It's, it's definitely nothing that goes away instantly. That's why the $2 fine, you know, new employees would get $100 out of them in the first month. But after that, they stop. And then we give the money to charity. We're not trying to punish them, as we said. See, there's, we're trying again. We're not intending We're yeah. not intending to punish them. Um, but to, And I, I do it in my seminars, too. We'll have it in the front of the stage. $2 for any of those words. $20 if your phone goes off. And $20 if you're late. And people, it's amazing how much better they behave when they know there's a consequence. How do you handle people like me? Because when that happens, I always set my phone alarm to be a ring, and then I put my phone in someone else's bag and have it go off. and Just for fun? Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm still that guy. <laughs> I haven't gotten around that before. But it, it's amazing how how flustered someone will get when they're like, it's not me, it's not me, and then they just completely lose it. And you're like, oh, yeah, it was me. And then I'll pay the 20 bucks. I don't care. It's just worth yeah, it for a while. I, I like humor, so I probably do just enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, people do that. Uh, I, I do the same thing sometimes. And it's, it's fine if you need to look at something, but just for God's sake, turn off the. the I, I did a seminar and... once where about five minutes into it, 200 cell phones all rang at the same time. And uh, because what we were doing was if you're cell phone with 20 bucks and there's a woman that was our singer, a woman named Janice Stanfield, and she was starting an orphanage in, in Thailand. And so this was a way that they wanted to raise as much money as possible for her orphanage and screw with me at the same time. So basically that's what happened. They had all, everyone had their cell phone go off at the same time. Somehow they had people call them or something. (laughs) It was, it was hysterical. (laughs) (laughs) That's, that's perfect. Uh, when, when you, you can kind of turn it around. Uh, and, and it's, it's also good when it's for a good cause. Yeah. Now you've, You've built that that thinking around those words into uh, into your life, and and the challenge that I I ran into in in working on Game Changers is similar uh, to to the book that you wrote on success. It was uh, the Success mm-hmm. Principles, uh, and you uh, went through a a similar and maybe more exhaustive effort, uh, to be honest, uh, where you interviewed a bunch of people. What was your process for boiling it down into the the sixty seven things you came up with? Like, how how did you how did you do that? Well, I started out by making a list one morning in bed. I was with my computer in bed, and I made a list of one hundred and fourteen principles. I, I was saying, why have I been so successful? I was just really curious because here I was. I'd made six million dollars a year before. I was a little kid from Wheeling, West Virginia, whose father made eight thousand dollars a year. So for me, it was like, yo, this is a big time success. 
how did I do that? So I started looking at all the principles I live my life by, and I had 114, which is way too many for a book. And um, so I basically scaled it down to about 60, 70. And then I said, okay, are these just idiosyncratic to me? Or are they principles that other people live by? So I made a list of the principles, and I did like a little paragraph explanation of each one, what I meant by it. And I picked 75 really successful people, generals in the military, movie stars, Olympic athletes, top salespeople, whatever. And I sent out the list and I said, you know, if you've used any of these principles, if they're the principles you've worked, lived your life by, would you be willing to have me interview you? And I got about 75 responses and I interviewed every one of them. And then I basically edited cut out all the extraneous material till I had a lot of stuff. And then I used their stories to illustrate all of the principles. It took, it was a better part of six months to do all that, but it was worth it. The, the weird thing is though, Dave, that a lot of people that read the first book would say to me, well, those principles are great if you're John Gray, if you're a gentleman in the military, if you're Steve Jobs, these people are all different, you know? And so when I wrote the 10th anniversary edition, which came out in 2015, I I replaced most of the Steve Jobs type stories, which I thought would tell people, wow, these guys were successful. They use these principles. You should too. But a lot of people basically said, no, I'm not like them. So I replaced all those stories with people who'd read the first book and were normal people and had gone on to you know, accomplish extraordinary things. So the second book, I think, is, is even more believable, if you will, because we've got homeless people who literally, you know, were living in a halfway house. And then all of a sudden, a year later, after reading my book, they'd started two businesses and were doing very, very successfully. People that were never supposed to walk again, walking, those kind of things. But they were just ordinary, everyday people. So that's how that came about. So you you had your your 10 years of field testing yes. to show that, that the stuff that works for Steve Jobs works for the rest of us as well. Exactly. It's interesting. You started with your uh, your own success principles. And in my case, uh, I, I definitely think I know some of them, but I wanted to uh, I wanted to get the data from people without without putting uh, putting my own spin on it uh, other than, than just this question and sort of see what the data came up with. But I, I will admit that, that there were some, I'll call it blind spots, either I, I, people didn't feel safe talking about it, largely around sex and around hallucinogenic substances, where I had a few experts on about those things, but everyone else just isn't going to mention it. And I love it that you hit on one of those big areas where a lot of people, unless I chose an expert on that, they weren't going to talk about hallucinogens because there's still some, you know, fear of, of either legal implications or, you know, would, will people think something ill of me? And I, I believe that their use is way more common among high performers than, than on average, but it's not the Disneyland use. So I, I included some laws about that and, and you know, got some data outside of my official survey. And then there, I interviewed a few experts on sex and relationships like Esther Perel, uh, even a professional dominatrix uh, and, and, and ancient Taoist uh, practices on, on things like that because... Uh, that that matters uh, for for people, and certainly our mutual friend John Gray would would be the first to tell you. You know, if, if you don't have things right uh, in your relationships at home, including in the bedroom, uh, you're probably not going to have things right at work and in the rest of your life. So I I I'll say padded it with some of my own experiences, um, but I I also didn't I think have the benefit of of as much work in the field as you had when you wrote your first one. So I I like that process, and I, I think that your book, both the first edition and the new one, uh, is is very noteworthy research in the field and worth reading, and and has the effect that what you've now shown it has, which is one of the reasons I wanted to interview you for Game Changers because. Uh, let's face it, it's a lot less work to ask someone who's done it for 20 years longer than you how to do it than it is to figure it all out yourself. Now, one of the great uh, advice I got when I was younger was study with the masters. Your life will, you know, evolution will occur faster if you study with a master. And then someone recently said every master was once a disaster, which is also true. So, <laughs> But, you know, if you're going to study boxing, you know, study with someone who really knows what they're doing. The same thing is true with meditation, your life, uh, you know, relationships, sex, the whole deal. When I was young, and not just a teenager, even as uh, in my 20s, I was really egotistical. And, and I also thought, you know, I'm if I can't do it by myself, 
Uh, it's probably because you know I'm, I'm not good enough or I'm a bad person, so I'm just going to pretend that I can do it by myself. And and it leads to you know resistance to learning and and unwillingness to ask and unwillingness to take advice. And I finally got over that. What's your advice for people who are advice resistant? You know, I forget the guy's name. He was a worker on a dock in in San Francisco, and he became like this you know everyday philosopher. I just can't think of his name right now, but he said you know. Uh, learners will inherit the earth. And basically, you know, if you're willing to learn, because everything's changing so fast, and that's even more so now than it was like 30 years ago when he made that statement, that you have to be willing to learn. You know, and another phrase I learned early on when I was running trainings with a company called Insight Training Seminars was I'd rather be right than happy is where a lot of people live their life from. And I'd rather be happy than right. And so I'm always open to learning, you know, that, that, that you listen to people's experience. You know, my, my first mentor was a man named W. Clement Stone. He was worth $600 million. He was extremely successful. He was a good friend of Napoleon Hill who wrote Think and Grow Rich. In fact, they wrote two books together uh, that are not as famous, but, but he did do that. And, um, you know, he he basically said, you know, learn from OPE, other people's experience. There's no reason you have to reinvent the wheel every time. Uh, find out someone who's done what you want to do and ask them how they did it. Read their books, take their seminars, you know, go to their workshops. Now it's listen to their TED Talks, listen to, you know, the, the, their videos on YouTube. There's so much information out there that you can learn to become better. I'm not sure why people become so resistant. I think it's just a. I think maybe they've been made wrong so much in their youth that they they feel like they have to stand up against, you know, their father or or the, some teacher who put them down or whatever, and it's not okay to be wrong. Uh, and I think men, you know, they never ask for directions because they don't want to be wrong. Uh, we need to overcome that. Maybe it's part of the masculine conditioning that we all go through, but it's basically not a good way to go through the world. Uh, you know. You've heard the phrase, I'm sure maybe you wrote about it, called suffering is optional. And a lot of suffering is because we're not willing to listen to the advice that people have. You know, people that have gone before us in Africa, they're called guides. And you don't want to be eaten by a crocodile in the wrong river. And I think the same thing is true for every area of life. There's people that just have spent their life studying like you have, like I have, like John Gray has, like all the people we've mentioned have. And so there's just so much value there. Um so basically, I just invite people to be open. Thank you for, for that advice. And I, I sure wish I'd have heard that a lot earlier in my life, but I'm, I'm playing catch up yeah. now at this point. Well, you're catching up very fast from what I can tell. Well, uh, th thanks, Jack. Coming from you, that's, uh, that, that's an incredible compliment. Uh, I, I really enjoyed interviewing you today. Uh, th thank you for being on Bulletproof Radio. Uh, thank you for uh, your work, uh, in particular, uh, your Breakthrough to Success uh, book, the, the training program you have behind it, uh, is, uh, it's, it's meaningful work on solving this problem that I think a lot of listeners, and we're going to cross 100 million downloads this year, so it, it's, it's a lot of people. Uh, they're, they're saying, you know, what, what do I do next? And I, I think that you've, uh, you've spent a lot of time codifying those things. I, I've definitely taken, uh, my take on these things and put it in, on this book. And as you said, it's, it's a huge amount of work to do it. Um, but I, I think these are the things where you get to learn from other people's mistakes instead of the expensive cost of making it yourself. So th thanks for making all your mistakes right. and learning from them and sharing it. That's a good thing. I've never heard anyone thank me for making all my mistakes before, but I. <laughs> that's a good way of framing it. That's a good way of framing it. No, people could just go to my website, jackcamfield.com, and find out about all the stuff we do. I'd love to be of service to any of your students. Yeah, I just, I, I want people listening. Uh, if, if you still think Jack Canfield is, you know, chicken soup for the soul and kind of that's it. Now, there's, there's a lot of incredible, incredible value. Uh, around the sorts of things that that are bulletproof, uh, and and Jack is you know one of the great the great thinkers in the field. So it, it's it's a super honor to, to be able to interview you, uh, to be able uh, to call you a friend, uh, and to even be able to include you in Game Changers as one of the the luminaries uh, I had a chance to interview. So Jack, thanks again, man. Uh, you've written a great book, and I encourage all my students to read it as well. So thanks for the opportunity to play together. I look forward to the next time, Dave. If you enjoyed today's interview, you know what to do. Pick up your copy of Game Changers wherever you like to buy books. You can pre-order it if it's not available uh, yet by the time this podcast comes out. 
And uh, when you do it, if you go to aspergamechangers.com, you can check out $175,000 in gifts and uh, prizes that you can get, including some pretty big ticket items uh, that could actually change your life. So I'm really doing my best to pay it forward. And if you like the show, share the show with a friend. And if you like the book or you like Jack's books, go to Amazon, take 10 seconds to leave a five-star review to tell people what you think, because authors like us, we pay attention to that stuff, and so do other people who are looking for what they should read next. Both Jack's books, uh, my books, they are worth your time, and hopefully the show is worth your time as well. Thanks for listening.